Hello again, Psych 370 students, and welcome to your first video lecture for week seven. This week marks the beginning of unit three of the course. And in this unit, we're gonna transition away from classical conditioning, which is what we spent the last unit on, and toward what we call operant or instrumental conditioning. So this video lecture is gonna contain an introduction to operant conditioning. And it's actually an excerpt from a lecture that I gave last spring via Zoom. In fact, the first three video lectures for this week are all excerpts from that class. So in this first one, I'm gonna introduce and define operant conditioning by comparing and contrasting it with classical conditioning. And I'm also gonna talk about something called the law of effect which was first formulated by a psychologist named Edward Thorndike, and which is really the most basic, most fundamental principle there is in all of operant conditioning. So pretty basic, pretty introductory level stuff here in this first video lecture. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So I think most of you guys are probably already familiar with the concept of operant conditioning, but I really should introduce it and sort of define it here. And I think the best way to do that is probably to sort of compare and contrast it with classical conditioning, uh, because people do get classical and operant conditioning mixed up with each other once in a while, which is honestly a somewhat understandable mistake because they are fairly similar to each other. Uh, I mean, they both involve changes in behavior, right? So they're both forms of learning. Um, they both involve a lot of the same processes too, like acquisition, extinction, generalization, discrimination. We could talk about that stuff with operant conditioning, just like we did with classical conditioning. And they both involve learning to associate things, which is why they're both forms of conditioning. Now, your textbook author uses the term operant learning for this, which isn't wrong, but the type of learning that he's describing there and in the textbook uh, is really much more commonly referred to as operant conditioning because it does involve learning to associate things. And that's what conditioning is in psychology, right? It's an associative form of learning. It's a process that involves learning to associate things. You're learning about an association with conditioning. Right? So we do learn to associate things in operant conditioning too, but guys, one of the key differences between classical conditioning and operant conditioning is that in classical conditioning, you learn to associate two stimuli, right? You learn to associate the conditioned stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. But in operant conditioning, you learn to associate your own behavior with the consequences of those behaviors. So in other words, in operant conditioning, we learn to associate what we do with what happens after we do it. So for example, if my son says, please, when he asks me for a cookie, uh, and then I give him the cookie, then he's probably gonna say please more often in the future, right? Because he'll associate that behavior, saying please, with that consequence, getting a cookie, right? And since that's a consequence that he'll probably wanna experience again, then that's a behavior, saying please is a behavior that he will probably perform again. So that's one way to think about the difference between classical and operant conditioning. In classical conditioning, you learn to associate two stimuli, right? You learn to associate the CS with the US. And in operant conditioning or instrumental conditioning, you learn to associate a behavior with the consequence that follows that behavior. And so if it's a consequence that you like, then the frequency of that behavior will probably increase, right? It'll get reinforced we'd say, and if it's a consequence you don't like, then the frequency of that behavior will probably decrease, right? It will get punished. So like I said, that's one way to think about the difference between classical and operant conditioning, but I wanna give you another way to understand that difference here that has always been useful for me, okay? So in addition to involving different associations, like I just talked about, classical and operant conditioning also involve learning to make different types of behaviors. Okay, so there's an important difference here between the sorts of behaviors that you acquire via classical conditioning and the ones that you acquire, the ones that you learn to make via operant conditioning, okay? And so to explain what I'm talking about here, I'm gonna give you a couple of P words to keep this difference straight. 
couple of P words here. So guys, in classical conditioning, the new response that you acquire, the behavior that you learn to perform in classical conditioning is best understood as a preparatory response, right? So there's your first P word, preparatory. In classical conditioning, the conditioned response is a preparatory response, right? It usually makes sense to view that conditioned response as a preparatory response. It's what you do to prepare yourself for the unconditioned stimulus. Okay? So preparatory responses in classical conditioning. But in operant conditioning, the new behavior, the behavior that you learn to perform in operant conditioning isn't just preparatory, rather it's productive, okay? So there's your second P word, productive responses in operant conditioning. In operant conditioning, the behavior that you learn to perform or the behavior that you learn to perform more frequently, like saying please, is something that actually produces a certain consequence, like a cookie. But remember, the conditioned response in classical conditioning does not do that, right? It prepares you for something, but it doesn't produce anything. It doesn't actually cause anything to occur. So for example, take Pavlov's dogs, right? They could salivate when they heard the bell or the metronome or whatever the CS was. They could perform that conditioned response, right? And that response did prepare them for the meat, it prepared them for that unconditioned stimulus, but it didn't make the meat occur, right? It didn't produce the meat. The meat was gonna occur for those dogs, no matter what they did. The dogs were gonna get that meat regardless of whether they salivated or not, regardless of whether they made that conditioned response or not. So again, classical conditioning involves learning to make preparatory responses, right? But operant conditioning involves learning to make productive responses. So for example, let's say that your dog has learned that if it barks after you say speak, then it gets a treat, right? And if it doesn't bark, it doesn't get a treat. Well, guys, barking in that case is an operant response, okay? It's not a classically conditioned response because in that case, barking actually produces the treat, right? It actually makes the treat occur. That behavior produces that consequence because that's a consequence. The treat is a consequence that will only occur if the dog performs the behavior, right? The dog's got to do the trick here to get the treat. And again, since that's a consequence, since that treat is a consequence that the dog will presumably want to experience again, then that barking behavior is a response that it will probably perform again. It's probably going to bark again the next time you say speak, because it'll learn to associate that behavior in that situation with that consequence. Okay. So again, guys, with operant conditioning, the response is productive, right? It's not just preparatory. In fact, that's why we call it operant conditioning. Okay. You can think of it like the person or the animal is sort of operating on the environment through their behavior in order to produce certain outcomes. Right? Or like I said before, we also call it instrumental conditioning. Operant conditioning is also known as instrumental conditioning because it involves learning that certain behaviors are instrumental in bringing about certain consequences. Right? So in other words, the animal's behavior is like the instrument that it's using right, to obtain certain consequences and to avoid others. So like I said, that preparatory versus productive distinction is, is one that has always been helpful for me as far as telling the difference and keeping that difference straight between classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Okay. So again, <clears throat> in operant conditioning, we're looking at how a behavior changes. We're looking at whether it becomes more frequent or less frequent because of the consequences that follow that behavior. And that's pretty obvious. It's pretty obvious that what happens after you do something is gonna have an effect on how likely you are to do that thing again, right? So nobody really discovered <laughs> operant conditioning in quite the same way that Pavlov discovered classical conditioning. But the story 
of operant conditioning and psychology really ought to begin, I think, with this guy, an American psychologist named Edward Thorndike, because he's the one who carried out the first real systematic scientific studies of operant conditioning. And guys, what those studies led to, what Thorndike's le uh, findings led to, was a very simple, but very important principle called the law of effect. And so basically, guys, the law of effect goes like this. If you do something and then something good happens, so if that behavior is followed by a consequence that you find pleasant or favorable or satisfying, then guess what? You do it again. <laughs> you tend to do it again. That behavior becomes stronger. It becomes more likely to occur again in the future when you find yourself in another similar situation. Or to put it like Thorndike put it, that behavior gets stamped in. Okay, It gets sort of stamped into your mind because of this satisfying consequence that followed it. But of course, if you do something and then something bad happens, or then nothing happens at all, then that behavior is going to get stamped out, right? You become less likely to repeat that behavior again in the future because of the annoying consequence or the lack of any consequence at all that followed it, okay? So we repeat behaviors that have satisfying effects, and we don't repeat behaviors that don't have satisfying effects. That's the law of effect, essentially. And like I said, that's pretty obvious. The law of effect is a pretty intuitive principle. So it wasn't really the idea of the law of effect that made Thorndike famous. It was how he demonstrated it scientifically in his research. And to do that, Thorndike used cats as his research subjects. Kind of interesting to me that the famous studies on classical conditioning involved dogs and the famous ones on operant conditioning involved cats. And Thorndike would put those cats into what he called puzzle boxes, like the one that you're seeing on this slide. So this is a pretty simple one, right? In this one, if the cat steps on this little pedal here, then that's gonna unlock this latch, the door will swing open, right? And the cat's gonna be able to escape from the puzzle box and eat this food that's waiting for it on the outside. So what Thorndike would do is he would time these cats to see how long it would take them to escape from the puzzle box. And what he noticed was the first time he put a certain cat in a certain puzzle box, it would basically just perform this range of behaviors. You know, so it's not like it would just sit there and think about it, like, hmm, I wonder what I need, need to do to get out of here. Uh, no, it, it would just sort of screw around for a while, right? I mean, it would, it would walk around the box, it would meow, it would scratch at the walls, it would sort of maybe uh, paw, outside the box at the food. Okay, so just a bunch of random behaviors, more or less. But eventually, the cat would just so happen to do what it needed to do. It would just so happen to step on the pedal in this case. And of course, after it did that, it got to experience the rewarding, satisfying consequences of that behavior, like getting to escape from the puzzle box and getting to eat the food. And so it looked to Thorndike like these cats were just sort of stumbling upon, accidentally stumbling upon the solution to the puzzle. He didn't think they were using any sort of insight or any real intelligence to figure out how to escape. No, they were just sort of getting out through a process of trial and error. Okay. But Thorndike also noticed that if he kept putting the same cat in the same puzzle box over and over again, that cat would start escaping from the puzzle box faster and faster. So as you can see in this graph here, the escape latency, right? That's what this is, time required to escape in seconds. So that's escape latency, right? How long does it take the animal to step on the pedal in this case? That escape latency would steadily decrease as the cat experienced more and more trials in the puzzle box. So in other words, that behavior that the cat had initially just stumbled upon, stepping on the, on the pedal, that behavior started becoming more and more likely, right? That behavior got stronger. That cat started performing that behavior more and more quickly because of these good, satisfying consequences that followed it. 
Okay, so Thorndike did all of this really methodical research, right, with these precise measurements and these carefully constructed graphs, and he used his results to support what he called the law of effect, which again just says that a behavior will become more likely to occur again if it's followed by favorable consequences, and it'll become less likely to occur again if it's followed by unfavorable consequences. So that's what the law of effect is all about. Again, it's a very simple principle, but it's a very important principle. The law of effect is basically the foundation on which all of operant conditioning is built. So just to make sure we're giving Thorndike his due for being the one to formulate and demonstrate the law of effect, I have a video that I wanna include here about that puzzle box research with the cats that I just described. But how is a new skill learned? That was a question which began to fascinate Thorndike. To answer it, he built some ingenious puzzle boxes from which cats could only escape by operating latches. And in you go. The cat appears to be very clever in engineering its escape, solving the problem with a deftly placed paw and a push of its nose. But Thorndike didn't believe that an animal, even a clever cat, understands the consequences of its behavior. When he placed a cat in the puzzle box for the first time, Thorndike was unable to see any evidence of flashes of insight. The successful actions appeared first by chance. He proved that the apparent cleverness arose by trial and error, and used graphs to measure the rate of learning. A well-practiced cat quickly recalls the actions that help it escape to its reward of food. If an action brings a reward, Thorndike believed that that action becomes stamped into the mind. In his thesis, he explained further his ideas about learning, that behavior changes because of its consequences. He called this his law of effect, which explained how even wild creatures develop new habits. Okay, so behavior changes because of its consequences. That's the basic idea behind the law of effect. And again, that's pretty obvious, but it's the backbone of operant conditioning. The law of effect is the simplest, most fundamental principle there is in all of operant conditioning. Whether or not you do something again depends on the consequences that follow that behavior. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and stop this video lecture here, but as always, if you have questions about any of this stuff, then please let me know. Take care.